Is reading comprehension holding you back from passing GED RLA and moving ahead? Well, in this video, we're going to go through practice questions and tips and tricks and strategies to help you pass faster so you can move ahead to bigger and better things in life like college or a better job. And we're starting right now. The door of Henry's lunchroom opened and two men came in. They sat down at the counter. What's yours? George asked them. I don't know, one of the men said. What do you want to eat, Al? I don't know, said Al. I don't know what I want to eat. Outside it was getting dark. The street light came on outside the window. The two men at the counter read the menu. From the other end of the counter, Nick Adams watched them. He had been talking to George when they came in. So your first question is, what is the setting? So I'd like you to pause the video and try to figure out what the setting is. Maybe reread this if you have to. Take all the time you need and then unpause the video and we'll go over the answer. Okay, so whether or not you get this question or any other question in this video right is not really what we're concerned with here. We're all about the learning and the knowledge and helping you get ready for your tests. So whether you got this right or wrong isn't the most important thing. What I want you to take away from this though is an understanding of the setting and hopefully how to find it. So the setting we see here is in Henry's lunchroom, all right? At least that's all we know so far. It's a place called Henry's lunchroom. And we also know that the time was probably just before nighttime because it says outside it was getting dark. So we would assume that this is taking place just before nighttime in a location called Henry's lunchroom. All right, so the setting is very important and the setting is where the story takes place and also when. And sometimes it will be told to you directly and clearly where and when the story is taking place, but sometimes it won't always be so clear. And sometimes they'll tell you where the story is taking place, but it's not exactly clear when until later on in the story or vice versa. But note that these are the two components that you should think of when you think of setting. So setting, where, and when. And just know that you might get questions point blank on the GED test. You might have to read a passage and it might just ask you point blank, what is the setting of this passage? Okay, but also whether or not you get asked a question asking you what is the setting, it's still really, really important to nail down what the setting is. So whenever you're reading a fiction piece or this can apply in nonfiction as well, um, you know, you always want to try to figure out where and when the story is taking place. And like I said, it's not always going to be clear, all right? But to the best of your ability, you want to try to figure this out. And part of the reason is because it's going to help you picture what's happening. So for example, if a story takes place out in the country on a farm, okay, and maybe you get confused and you're picturing the story as taking place in a really busy city, okay, it's going to probably be hard to understand what's happening in the piece. So Part of the reason you want to nail down that setting is, is just so you can have a clear mental picture of what's happening, all right? So the next question here is, who are the characters in the story so far? So I'd like you to this time pause the video, take all the time you need, list out who are all the characters in the story. Now, if you want to do this on paper, okay, that's probably good. If you want to do it in your head, that's fine too, whatever works for you. So I'm going to give you a chance to pause the video, take all the time you need, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the characters so far, we see right away that the door of Henry's lunchroom opened and two men came in. So we see a man named George, and we see that there's a man named Al, and there's Nick Adams, and there must be another man here, right? Because it says two men came in, all right? And we've got George, we've got Al, and then we've got one of the other men who we don't have a name for this person, okay? So hopefully you figured these out, or at least you got most of these. And so the method here that I'm kind of teaching you is what I call the SCCT method. It's the setting, characters, conflict, and theme. Okay, so we're not ready to talk about conflict and theme yet. That'll be something later on in the story that we touch on more, or later on in the video, I should say. But we've talked about setting and we've talked about characters. And to me, really the key to kind of unlocking your understanding of most fiction stories is, first of all, understanding the setting and when the setting changes too, all right? So for example, what I mean by setting changes, all right, if part of the story is taking place in a hospital and then they go and travel to somebody's apartment and you miss that detail that the setting has changed, 
and you're still trying to, you know, picture the events taking place in a hospital when it's really taking place in an apartment. Hopefully you can see how that could kind of uh, make it hard to understand what's happening. So the setting and, and where the setting changes is important to note, but also the characters. So when characters are introduced, take note of them. Just think of ways to tell the characters apart. That's another issue people have with comprehension uh, beyond knowing what the setting is, also keeping track of the different characters. And so you can even list them out on a sheet of paper if you want to, if that helps you, all right? So I'm just introducing this now, SCCT, okay? This is something that we'll touch on more in the video, all right? But I just wanna give you an introduction. And, and the reason why I'm proposing this method, and uh, this is something I put together here, SCCT, is because it can be really hard to take in all the information at once when you're reading a fiction passage. And this can apply for nonfiction too. All right, but the reason I, I'd like you to think about trying this method where as you're reading, you think about the setting, the characters, the conflict and the theme is because it's gonna help you break down all the information you're bombarded with into more manageable chunks, okay? So let's keep going here. I'll have a roast pork tenderloin with applesauce and mashed potatoes, the first man said. It isn't ready yet. What do you put it on the card for? That's the dinner, George explained. You can get that at six o'clock. George looked at the clock on the wall behind the counter. Okay, so here's your next question. Which of the following is most likely true about George? A, George is one of the men who walked into Henry's lunchroom. B, George works at Henry's lunchroom. C, George eats at Henry's lunchroom often. Or D, George is good friends with Al. So now would be a good time to pause the video Try this one out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the correct answer here is B, George works at the lunchroom. And basically what's happening here is that the man is asking for the dinner, and George is telling him that he can't order it until six o'clock. Okay, and it says George looked at the clock on the wall behind the counter. And so basically, uh, hopefully you see that George most likely works at Henry's lunchroom. So I don't expect you to read this slide unless you want to, but I just want to introduce that what we're gonna be using in the next question and throughout the video is a technique known as closed tasks. And I've done a lot of research into reading comprehension and most importantly, how to enhance your reading comprehension so that you can get a better test score, hopefully pass faster and move ahead faster. And I just want to show here that, you know, um, I'm not an expert in reading comprehension by any means, but I have done quite a bit of research. And so there is a method behind the techniques that we're using throughout this video here. And so the next part of the passage says, it's five o'clock. The clock says 20 minutes past five, the second man said. It's 20 minutes fast. Oh, enough with the clock, the first man said. You have, you got, what have you got to eat? I can give you any kind of sandwiches, George said. You can have ham and eggs, bacon and eggs, liver and blank, or a steak. So the next question is, which of the following words most likely belongs in the blank above? Is it A, time, B, bacon, C, orange juice, or D, cars? So now would be a good time to pause the video, try to figure this out, take all the time you need, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the answer here is B, bacon. All right, but most importantly, why do we know that that's the right answer? Well, in this case here, we're talking about uh, different types of sandwiches. So the context, context is you can have ham and eggs, bacon and eggs, liver and something, or a steak. Now, time and cars are completely different from all of the other things being discussed here, right? We're discussing ham and eggs. Time and cars are completely different. Those are not foods. All right, now orange juice, I suppose you could have liver and orange juice on the side as a drink. Okay, but that doesn't really fit with what kind of sandwich uh, you could have here. All right, so orange juice, you can't really put it on a sandwich. And if you can, you know, let me know down below if there's some way to do that. I don't know. I'm interested. But the correct answer here is B, because it says also which most likely belongs in the blank above. Bacon would go on a sandwich here. Bacon would make the most sense in this context. Okay. Give me chicken... Croquettes, I think is how you say that word, with green peas and cream sauce and mashed potatoes. That's the dinner. Everything we want's the dinner, eh? That's the way you work it. And just ignore this red line under here. I'm not sure why that's there. Did you mean ignore? Okay. Four. I can give you ham and eggs, bacon and eggs, liver. 
So your next question, who is most likely speaking in line three? Is it Nick Adams? Is it George? Or is it one of the men who walked in? So note that one of the men who walked in, there's two men that walked in. Again, it could be Al or the other man who hasn't been named here. But I want you to tell me in line three, which is right here, okay, who is most likely speaking here? Okay. So let's have you pause the video and try this out. Okay, so the correct answer here is C, one of the men who walked in, right? And there's a, con a conversation here going on between George, who works at the lunchroom, and one of the men that walked in, right? Because it says, give me blah, 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 blah with green peas. And then in the next line, George says, that's the dinner. And then in the next line, one of the men who walked in says, everything we watch the dinner at, that's the way you work it. And then George goes again, I can give you ham and eggs, bacon and eggs or liver. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. I'll take ham and eggs, the man called Al said. He wore a derby hat and a black overcoat buttoned across the chest. His face was small and pale and he had tight lips. He wore a silk muffler and gloves. Give me the bacon and eggs, said the other man. He was about the same size as Al. Their faces were different, but they dressed like blank. Both wore overcoats too tight for them. They sat leaning forward, their elbows on the counter. So your next question, which of the following words most likely fits in the blank above? Is it A, opposites, B, rocks, C, dolls, or D, twins? So now would be a good time to pause the video, take all the time you need, reread this if you need to, and when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over the answer. So the correct answer here is D, twins, all right? So twins, we usually would think of identical twins, although that's not the only kind of twins, all right? But in this case here, they're both wearing overcoats that are too tight for them, all right? And they're both doing the same thing. They're leaning forward with their elbows on the counter, all right? So their faces look different here, but they're both doing the same things. They're wearing the same things. They basically look the same, all right? So they're both dressing like twins, Okay, meaning they both look alike, they're wearing the same thing, and they're doing the same thing. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense here. What do they do nights do here nights, Al asked. They eat the dinner, his friend said. They all come here and eat the big dinner. That's right, George said. Question, which is the best inference we can make from this part of the passage? A, Al and his friend are from the area. B, Al and his friend are not from the area. C, Al and his friend are from California, or D, Al and his friend know George very well. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer as always. All right, so the correct answer here is B, and uh, if we take what we know so far from the passage and also what we see right here in this part of the passage together, we can make the inference that Al and his friend are not from the area. Okay, because they're asking, you know, they're not familiar with what's on the menu at all, first of all. And they also ask, what do people do around here? Basically, they're, they're saying, what do people do around here? All right, what do they do for fun here? And it seems to me like if they were from the area, they would already know what people do uh, for fun in the night around there. Alan and his friend are from California. Well, we have no idea where they're from. Uh, California hasn't been mentioned in this passage, so that's not the best inference. And also, D, Al and his friend know George very well. We don't really see any evidence of that. And in fact, we see kind of like a, a clash going on, at least from Al's perspective, kind of clashing with George here. So, so we couldn't really conclude that they know each other well. And all an inference is, it's an educated guess. And you have to think about your own experience and your own common sense, um, as well as the clues from the passage here to get an inference question right. This video's champion shout out goes to Rebecca, and Rebecca says, I just took my math test and failed by one point. Tomorrow is my retake and I know I got this. And so I really like that Rebecca is not only not giving up, but is feeling more confident going into her retake, which is always important here. So Rebecca's perseverance here is admirable. And she goes on to say, I'm showing my children that even at 28, it's never too late. And so as some of you know by watching my other videos here on this channel, uh, I just became a parent myself not too long ago, and I believe that one of the most important jobs you can ever do is, is set a good example and be a good role model for your kids. And so 
I just want to wish Rebecca the best of luck here and anyone else that's out there that's watching this who's struggling and maybe you're, you're yourself having to retake a section, just know that we're all in this together and I'm just wishing you the best of luck as we move forward here. Okay, so for names that I can't pronounce and I'm just going to use the letter, it was the design of Angelo R. and Joe C. and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Messers, and I think that's pronounced Messers, R, C, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than blank. So your first question, which word or words most likely fits in the blank above? Is it A, robbery? Is it B, veterinary medicine? Is it C, culinary arts? Or D, driving over the speed limit? So let me turn it over to you to try this question out. And then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So again, we have to look at the context and really understand what's happening here in this part of the story to get this right. So we have what the story says to quote from the story we've got this old man here and he's exceedingly rich he has got a lot of money but he's also very weak and vulnerable right so exceedingly feeble means that he is weak okay and also all right it says that the profession of the men here it's nothing less dignified than blank so if something is not dignified that means most people in society view it as a bad thing here so we could really take out B and C and driving over the speed limit. This isn't really talking about cars or driving or anything like that. Okay. So we'd really just have to think about the fact that we're talking about what the story says to quote the story, an old man here, who's got a lot of money, but he's also very vulnerable. All right. So robbery makes the most sense. It's a fill in the blank here. So A is the right answer. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. R and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn, I think is how you say that, that few know his real name. So just a quick note here too, you know, at any time, you know, you can pause the video and take all the time you need to read the passages, all right? So I'm not expecting that you're going to be able to, to just listen to me read most of these passages and just hear it one time and know the answer, all right? You're probably going to have to pause the video, at least on uh, a lot of these questions and, and take the time to reread it at a pace that's going to make sense to you. So know that if I'm reading fast here, it's just because I'm expecting that you know, everyone watching this will pause and reread and take their time reading it. All right. Uh, so again, thank you for sticking with me so far. The next question is, what is the setting of the story? So I'll turn it over to you to pause the video, try to figure this out, take all the time that you need, and then we'll go over the answer. So really, all we know so far is that this is taking place in a, in a place called Kingsport. And we're not really sure, is this a country? Is this a town? Is this a village? Okay, it says something here about uh, East India, but uh, if you thought East India was the setting here, just note that it, we have to consider the context again. So it's telling us here that nobody really knows much about this terrible old man. He's very strange, but people think maybe he had been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day. So this isn't necessarily telling us that this is taking place like on a clipper ship in East India. It's just telling us that he was a captain of an East India clipper ship. So you know, we're not really sure what the country is. It just tells us that there's a place called Kingsport here. And this is maybe at the house on Water Street by the sea where the terrible old man lives. Because it said in the last uh, in the last paragraph that his house is on Water Street uh, by the sea. So this is in a town called Kingsport and possibly the story is going to unfold around this old man's house. But we're not quite sure yet. So if you got Kingsport right, then, you know, that's the main thing I was looking for you to identify. If you thought East India, just know, like I said, that, you know, that might be an important detail here to keep in mind, but we don't necessarily know that that's the setting. All right. Okay. So, and just, again, repetition is really important for learning here. 
And that's why I like to just keep hitting points home over and over again. All right, because on the test, I want it to be fresh in your memory that to figure out the setting, you have to think about where the story takes place and when. And in this case, it's not completely crystal clear when this is taking place. You know, we're not even sure where we think it's some kind of town or village called Kingsport. All right, but that's really all we know so far. But just remember that, you know, when you ever you start reading a story, I want you to think right away, you know, what is the setting here and who are the characters? All right. So we go on to say here. Uh, so the next question is about this word. I think it's taciturn is how you pronounce it. It says the word taciturn most likely means which of the following? Is it A, the captain of a clipper ship? B, reserved in speech? C, friendly? Or D, wealthy? So let's have you pause the video, try to figure out what does the word taciturn mean, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer here. Okay, so similar to our closed deletion tasks where I, I blanked out a word, in this case we have a word that is bolded and underlined, and we have to figure out what the word might mean here. So again, what we're talking about here is that, you know, there's this, this terrible old man who's strange, nobody really knows very much about him. And it says that, you know, they, they suspect he was the captain of a, a clipper ship in his day, uh, but no one can remember when he was young. And it says here that the man is so blank that few people even know his real name. All right. So if he's really friendly here, you would think people would know his name or know something about him. So C is wrong here. All right. So wealthy that few know his real name. That, I mean, it could be, but that's probably not. It says here what is most likely correct, all right? So that's, we do know that the man is wealthy. It did tell us that. But, you know, is he so wealthy that few would know his name? I'm not sure that that is the best answer here, all right? Uh, and, you know, he is, he was probably the captain of clipper ships in his day. So, again, he, you know, he is wealthy. He probably was the captain of clipper ships. But, you know, would, would that be the reason that few know his real name? Probably not. I mean, maybe if he was like a secret agent, you know, or something, uh, and he ran, it was like a secret agent on a clipper ship. I don't know, but that's a little bit far-fetched here. So again, and these questions that ask you most likely or which of the following is the best explanation, you know, if multiple answer choices seem like they could be correct, you have to kind of pick the one that would make the most, uh, that's the most obvious, most simplistic here. And reserved in speech is hopefully the answer that jumps out at you, right? If he's so, if he's very reserved in speech, meaning he doesn't say a lot of stuff, it would make sense that few people would know his real name. Okay, so I just want you to see here that you know, um, it did tell us that he was wealthy. It told us that you know most people think he was the captain of a clipper ship, but neither of those things really would be reasons why people wouldn't know his name. All right, both of those things are probably true, but is that why no one knows his name? Probably not. But if he's reserved in speech and says very little, he doesn't talk a lot, that could be why few people know his name. Okay. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. Question, which of the following is false? A, the collection of stones scares away the small boys. B, the terrible old man has long white hair and beard. C, the collection, and that should say the collection, the collection of stones scares away the older folk, or D, the terrible old man's house has dusty paints. So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need on this question, maybe reread if you need to, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer here. Okay, so one thing that I want to point out here, and uh, this is kind of a trick that can help you uh, get the right answer sometimes, and, and no trick on the GED test is going to work all the time. But look at the answers A and C, all right? They're both talking about the collection of stones, right? The collection of stones scares away the small boys. The collection of stones scares away the older folk. So these two things, all right, could they both be true? Well, they could be, but since these answer choices are both saying basically the same thing, the only difference is that one is talking about small boys and the other is talking about the older folk, 
All right, whenever you see, a, you know, two answer choices that are basically the same thing, but there's only like, you know, one word or two that's changed, all right, one of them is probably going to be the one you want to pick. All right, that's not always going to be true, but that is kind of a, a little trick here. But, you know, we don't want to rely on tricks. We want to rely on our reading comprehension skills to get the question correct. But it basically it says here that the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes here, it says that there's other things that frighten them away. So remember, it is that collection of the stones that scares away the small boys. But, you know, the, the older folk who want to uh, kind of peek in to the guy's house or they want to investigate or see what's going on, they're not scared by those, those stones. They're scared away by something else. All right, so C is the right answer here. Okay, these folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within make certain definite vibrations as if in answer. So question, in two to three sentences, how would you summarize the passage above in your own words? And when I say the passage above, I just mean the text on the screen here. You don't have to summarize the entire story. I just want you to take this information that is right here and in just two to three sentences here, okay? Just put this in your own words. What does this mean? What what are we told in this passage here, right? Now, you might want to type this out or write it out by hand. You can do it in your head too, but that might be a little bit harder. But, you know, if you can do it that way, fine. It's up to you. It's all about you and your learning so that we can help you move ahead to the next stage of your life here. So this is the next practice here. Summarize the passage above in your own words. And again, this summarizing and putting things in your own words is a proven skill to help boost your reading comprehension. So let's have you try this now. And, and there's not really a right or wrong answer here. I just want you to try it. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to pause the video and try this. So this is just my answer here. And obviously you're not gonna have exactly the same answer I do. And, and that's probably like a one in the bajillion odds that you would get the exact same answer I have here. But I put, some say that the terrible old man has bottles on a table with lead connected to a string in each which acts as a pendulum. So the old man has a name for each bottle and he speaks to the bottles and the lead pendulums inside the bottles vibrate as if the bottles are answering him. So that's just my answer right here. Obviously you're gonna have something different. Okay, but as long as you kind of got this idea that you know he's got the older folk come up to the, the person's house, they look in on the ground floor, they see these weird bottles and He's got like lead in each of them that is, you know, vibrating. He talks to the bottles, they vibrate and stuff, and they vibrate as if the bottles are speaking back to him, and this scares the people away. Anything like that is really valid here. It's just an exercise to take something and put it in your own words, okay? Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo R. and Joe C. and Manuel Silva saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless gray beard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. Question. Why don't you think those who have watched the terrible old man speak to his bottles don't watch him again? There's no right or wrong answer. So I'd like you to pause the video. Think about it. Why don't they watch him again after they've seen it? And when you're ready, we'll go over possible answers here. Okay, so what I was thinking of, probably the most likely thing is they see the ritual and they're scared of him. Maybe they think he has some kind of magic powers, or maybe they just generally, um, they're just creeped out and they're freaked out by the ritual and they don't want anything to do with it. Um, it also could be they feel sorry for him, but I think the most likely thing is that they are probably frightened off by what they've seen. And so, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just up for you to just think critically here. And the more you think critically as you read, the more it's going to help you remember the story and just process it on a deeper level. It's going to help you understand, help boost your memory, and hopefully help you get more questions right. Okay. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow whom everybody shunned and, art, and at whom all the dogs bark singularly. 
But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his necessities at the village blank with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Which word most likely fits in the blank above? Is it A, B, C, or is it D? So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the correct answer here is B, store. All right, so it says here, the very feeble old man who has no account at the bank, so he, he can't put his money in the bank because he has no account there, he pays for his few necessities at the village store, all right? So he's buying his necessities, meaning things he needs, like food, uh, clothing, whatever else he needs. That's where he's going to get it at the store. So hopefully you saw that that was correct. Messrs. R, C, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. R and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, whilst Mr. C waited for them in their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street. And again, un ignore these underlined red words. That's just something my computer's doing. It has nothing to do with the question. Um, by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. I'm not sure how to say that word. Okay, which of the following is true? A. Mr. C and Mr. Silva were to interview the terrible old man. B. The robbers were not concerned with the police while making their plans. C. Mr. Silva was supposed to wait with the motor car. Or D. Mr. R and Mr. Silva, Silva were to interview the terrible old man. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, take all the time you need to, reread this if you need to, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so again, I'd like you to note answers A and answer D here. Mr. C and Mr. Silva were to interview the terrible old man versus Mr. R and Mr. Silva were to interview the terrible old man. So could both of these things be correct? Well, we know that there are three robbers here and that one of them is going to wait with the car. So... Either A or D has to be wrong. These can't both be true. Okay, so that's just what I mean when you see two answers that are basically the same thing, but there's only a slight difference. All right, in this case, these answers can't both be true. So that hopefully draws your attention to the fact that either A or D is probably going to be the right answer here. Okay. Now, it tells us here that it's Mr. R and Mr. Silva are going to interview the poor old man. We see that right here. And we see that it's Mr. C... Mr. C is going to be waiting in the car, okay? So hopefully you see that here. And it also tells us that, you know, basically they, they want to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusion. What in the world? Uh, that basically means that they are concerned with the police. And also uh, it is, that means that they are concerned with the police. And it's not Mr. Silva that's going to wait with the motor car. It's Mr. C. Hopefully that all is clear. Okay. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicion afterward. Messrs. R. and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man Locatius concerning his, I don't know how to pronounce that word, concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Okay, the question. The word locatius, which I'm not sure how to even pronounce, most likely means which of the following? Is it A, talkative? Is it B, secretive? Is it C, interested? Or D, relentless? So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out. And then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so one trick you can sometimes use in for questions like this is to kind of take this word here and just kind of like fill in each word here and kind of read the sentence in your head. Uh, when you're practicing, you can do it out loud, but you, you can't talk, obviously, when you're doing the test. So it might not make sense to actually talk it out loud when you're doing the test. But let me read the sentence here and just kind of put in answer A here. It says, they feared it might be unpleasant work, making the terrible old man talkative concerning his hoarded gold and silver. Does that make sense? I think it could work. Now let me try it with B. 
They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man secretive concerning his hoarded gold and silver. Well, think about that, all right? Why would we want the old man to be secretive regarding his treasure? Isn't the whole point here they are trying to come in and they're trying to figure out where the treasure is? So they wouldn't want him to be secretive about it, right? Um, so, so, you know, if you just, I'm not going to do it for the sake of time, but you can see sometimes how answering these questions, one strategy is just to kind of, you know, take each word and just kind of try to replace the word that is bolded and underlined with each word, like I did with talkative and secretive. And sometimes the answer just kind of jumps out at you. Um, and also just kind of thinking about the context here, right? So they're, they're trying to come in here and they're trying to figure out where the old man's has treasure hit. All right. So they're going to want, uh, to make the man talkative, all right? They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man talkative, all right? So they're scared that it's gonna be unpleasant and hard to get him to talk about his treasure. So A is the correct answer here. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. R and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Question. What do you predict will happen next? There are no right or wrong answers. And this is part of critical thinking and just part of processing the text on a deeper level. So what do you think is going to happen next? So pause the video, think about it, and then when you're ready, we'll talk about it. Okay, so probably there's obviously going to be some kind of a confrontation here, right? Because they're knocking, they just knocked on his door if they're wearing masks. There's probably going to be some kind of a um, confrontation here between them and the terrible old man. And I am predicting, you know, either it's going to go, there's really only a couple ways it can go. Either the robbers are going to find a way to get their way and they're going to get the treasure, possibly try to hurt the old man, or the terrible old man will scare them off somehow, or... In, in some other way, he will come out on top in the situation here. And it's not really, it's not clear yet. That's why it's a prediction. That's why I said there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but my guess here, and, and when I read this story for the first time, which I never read this story until I, I put together this video here. So my first read through of the story here, my actual prediction was that somehow the old man would scare the robbers away. That's because all the other adults that came to the house were scared away by his, you know, thing that he's doing with the bottles and, and uh, talking to the bottles and the vibrations. So I'm thinking, I was thinking somehow he's going to scare the robbers away. But like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. And we're going to find out the ending here shortly. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. C as he fidgeted relentlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Question. Where does Mr. C most likely think the screams came from? Is it A, the terrible old man, or is it B, Mr. R, and Mr. Silva? So Mr. C thinks the screams are coming from the terrible old man, right? And we see this because he... He hears the screams, and then he's concerned that they have somehow, you know, harmed the old man or done something to make him scream, okay? And we see that in the highlighted sentence here that I've shown here. He's concerned for the old man, all right? It says that he's more than ordinarily tender-hearted, okay? Which maybe this, you know, he's the more sympathetic one here. He wants to, you know, go after, you know, his money, but he doesn't want to harm people in the process, maybe, is what this is kind of telling us. And he seems like he's concerned that the old man's screaming. But the thing here that I think is interesting is that, you know, the the robbers don't really seem like they understand yet that, you know, maybe they are get they are the ones that are in trouble here. All right. So it seems like Mr. C thinks that, you know, his colleagues are in control of the situation and that they have somehow hurt the old man and made him scream. All right. But, you know. What I want you to think about now is where do you think the screams came from? Was it either the the robbers that are screaming? Was it the terrible old man? Or is there some new character or scenario that's going to be introduced here? All right. Where do you think they came from? So let's have you pause the video. Think about it. There's not really a right or wrong answer. I just want you to think about it and, you know, base your answer off of what we know from the story here. Okay. So... 
my answer here is is and like I said, there's not really a right or wrong answer here, but uh, it's it's probably Mr. R and Mr. Silva. Okay, so Mr. C thinks that they are in control of the situation, but really, all right, it seems like actually the terrible old man is getting the upper hand in the situation here. All right. Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his blank and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. C did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow heavy door swing inward. So your next question, which of the following words most likely fits into the blank above? Is it A, mirror? Is it B, watch? Is it C, diary? Or D, notebook? So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So the correct answer here is B, watch. All right, so he is concerned about the time, so he's going to check his watch. Now it's possible he might be checking his notebook or a diary to, you know, see, to re review the plan or something, if he has a plan written in his notebook here. All right, but since it says he wondered that at the delay, probably watch is, is going to be the one you'd want to guess here. All right, and watch is the correct answer. And in the pallid glow of the single, glow of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on the knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. C had never before noticed the color of the man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Okay, which of the following is false? A. Mr. C did not see the other two robbers. B. The terrible old man had yellow eyes. C. The terrible old man walked with a cane, or D. Mr. C could clearly see what was coming out of the house. So let's have you pause the video and think about this. Is it A, B, C, or D? Okay. The correct answer here is D. Mr. C could clearly see what was coming out of the house. Well, we see here that he had to straighten his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of the house. So he's straining his eyes. It's hard to see. There's a single dim street light here. All right. So D is the best answer here. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentified which the tide washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street or certain especially in human cries, probably of a strained animal or migratory bird heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. Question. What do you think is the theme of the story? There's no right or wrong answer here. I'd just like you to think about the theme of the story here. Okay, so a tip here is to be prepared for questions about theme. These are fairly common on the test. So the theme is the message that the writer wants to communicate to the reader, okay? And it's usually a statement about human nature or how the world works. Okay, so when we talk about the theme of the story here, there's possible answers. You know, there's, there's no right or wrong answer really, but one could be don't try to rob or harm the most vulnerable in our society, okay, because it just might backfire. And, you know, in this case here, we see that the robbers, you know, they tried to, you know, take advantage of harm wrong from this terrible old man. All right. And it kind of backfired on them. All right. For lack of a better way to put it. So now I'm going to answer some questions from this random questions generator, and hopefully none of them are too awkward. French fries or onion rings? You know what? I actually would take onion rings for sure. That's just me, though. Board games or video games? Oh, I'm for sure taking video games. Batman or Superman? Definitely Batman for me. I just think Batman's a cooler character. Dogs or cats? Well, growing up, I was always a dog person because that's what we had. But then when I lived in Philadelphia with my wife, we had a mice infestation and we went out and we got a cat and I've never looked back. So I'm going to have to go cats.
So the wrap paraphrasing strategy is one of the most important and useful strategies that you can use for reading comprehension. And this comes from research done by Shoemaker, Denton, and Deschler. And before we jump into the actual strategy, you should know that some of the benefits are that it can boost memory and recall. It can help you increase your attention span while reading. It can help you increase your understanding of the text. And it's overall just a simple and efficient method that you can apply. Now, this strategy is probably going to be more directly applicable to nonfiction passages, but you can use it for fiction as well, for sure, in some cases. And there's a lot of evidence behind this strategy. For example, one study found that it helped students increase recall of text from 48% all the way up to 84%. And I don't have this on the slide, but I know that there was another study, I believe it was in 1990, where Ellison Graves used the RAP strategy with middle school students with learning disabilities, and they found that it helped them uh, more easily identify main ideas, which is something important for the GED test. So just keep in mind here that there's evidence behind this strategy here. There is a method behind what we're teaching. And I've taught this in several other YouTube videos, and I know students that have had a lot of success using this. So it's really as simple as uh, RAP, R-A-P. The R stands for read the paragraph, all right? The A stands for ask what's the main idea and two supporting ideas. And P stands for put it in your own words, or in other words, paraphrase. All right, paraphrasing is just one way of saying put it in your own words. Okay, and so, you know, obviously when you actually take the GED test, you're free to decide how you want to apply this strategy. Okay, you might find that in some for some passages, all of the steps of the strategy might just not work for you. Okay. Like it might not, for example, if you're in the middle of a fiction story, it might not make sense to stop in the middle of it and ask about the main idea and ask what are two supporting ideas, okay? Or maybe it will. It, it's up to you to decide when and how to use this. But I think if nothing else, hopefully you'll understand how effective the strategy can be. And especially the last step, the P, put it in your own words, is one of the most powerful things you can do, in my opinion, to help boost your reading comprehension. So. If you're not sure what I mean by the main idea, the main idea is just the main point of the paragraph, and it's usually found in the first sentence, all right? It's usually stated in one sentence. It could be at the end of the paragraph, though. It could also be in the middle of it. Uh, sometimes the writer helps you out, and they just very clearly put the main idea right in the first sentence. A lot of times you will see that, but sometimes it's more obscure and a little bit harder to figure out. Um, repetition of words or ideas can be another clue as to what the main idea is, but a really, really effective way to figure out what the main idea is, all right, and, and is to think what title would you give this paragraph, all right? So if you read a paragraph and then you think, if I had to give this a title, like if I was going to pick the title of a book or of a movie, okay, what title would I give this? And, and sometimes that helps people zero in on the main idea. So if nothing else from this video, all right, when you get questions asking you what, what's the main idea, think about, you know, what title would I give this paragraph, all right? What would I call this? If, if, I, if this was a book or if this was a movie, what would be the best title idea? Because oftentimes that helps you cue in on what the main idea is. So if nothing else, that's a really good takeaway, I think, from this video that could help you. All right, um, and as far as supporting ideas go, supporting ideas go back and support that main idea. So if you think like a table here, all right, the, the main idea is the table and the legs that hold that main idea up are the supporting ideas, okay? And these are like facts and examples, things like that, okay? And like I said, paraphrasing is just putting ideas in your own words. So in other words, you're kind of pretending like you've ex you're explaining the plot of a show or movie. So have you ever had it where you've watched a movie or you've watched a show and you're talking to your friend and your friend says, oh, I never saw that show. What's it about? Or what happened in the movie? And, you know, you explain to them in your own words what the movie or the show was about. So that's that's all we mean here by putting things in your own words. All right. So, again, wrap. R stands for read the paragraph. A stands for ask what's the main idea and two supporting ideas. And P stands for put it in your own words. So let's go over an example here uh, to help you practice using this. And Hopefully this example is easy. I want this to be as easy and as simple as possible just because I want you to practice using the technique here, okay? You know, I, I didn't, I, I wrote this passage myself and I wanted this to be pretty simple and easy just to give you practice using the technique. So 
the passage says, the Nintendo Wii U was a massive commercial failure. Many customers initially believed it was an accessory to the original Wii rather than a separate console and were thus unwilling to pay for it. While the Wii U featured better graphics than the original Wii, both the PS4 and Xbox One's graphics were superior. While the Wii U did have some excellent games, there weren't nearly enough to compete with the large amount of offerings on the PS4 and Xbox One. Okay. So your first question, what is the main idea of the passage? And like I said, hopefully this will be pretty simple for you, and if it's not, that's okay. But, you know, I just want you to get some practice using this technique. So you can pause the video and try this out. Okay, so the main idea is right here. The Nintendo Wii U was a massive commercial failure. And like I said, the main idea is often, if it's really clear and, and you know, clear writing, that the person will just put it right at the beginning and just make it a clear statement. But, you know, sometimes they make it a little bit harder to find. And sometimes there's not really a clear main idea. But, you know, in, in a standard case, they'll just put it right in the first sentence and it'll just kind of be direct and clear. Now, what are two supporting details in this passage? So I'd like you to pause the video and try to find two supporting details and then when you're ready, unpause the video. So really, after the first sentence, each sentence is a supporting detail, right? So the first sentence tells us the main idea of this paragraph is that the Wii U was a commercial failure. And then each sentence gives us a different reason why. So any two sentences that you picked out would be examples of supporting details in the passage. Okay, so the last question says, how can you put this passage in your own words? And this is really the most important step. So I think knowing how to find the main idea and knowing what supporting ideas are, that that's also really important to know. But, you know, being able to put things in your own words is really one of the most powerful reading comprehension tips, I think. Um, because in, in some cases, it's easy to read something and think that you understand it. But then if you go and try to explain it in your own words, sometimes you realize, oh, I didn't understand that as well as I thought I did. All right. So let's have you pause the video and try to put this passage in your own words. And then when you're ready, I'll show you an example of how you could do it. So there's not really a right or wrong answer here, but basically this is this is what I have. So the Wii U was a big commercial failure because customers didn't understand it was a separate console from the Wii preferred the better graphics on other systems, and believed it didn't have enough games to buy. And for the record, I did buy a Wii U. It's hard to believe it was going on 10 years ago now. Um, and I bought it because I wanted to get the, the Zelda game, which became Breath of the Wild. And so I, I had that Wii U, and I bought it just for that game. And I actually got the game, and I, I played it for like an hour, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. And I just got too busy, and I never picked it up since. And, and so, you know... Uh, yeah, that's my little story about the Wii U, but it is one of my favorite systems, but, you know, uh, unfortunately it did not do well, uh, in sales, even though some of the games were pretty cool. But anyway, uh, so hopefully you see that, hopefully this example is pretty easy and straightforward to understand. I just wanted to give you some practice using this powerful strategy. And so now obviously it's up to you to decide how you want to apply this on your test. Okay, so our next passage is a passage that comes from a uh, sample practice set of questions from the GED testing service. So let's read this together and then I'll give you the question. So it says, on June 29, 1947, the 33rd president of the United States, Harry S. Truman, addressed the 38th annual conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. In a speech calling for civil rights and human freedom, Truman described the efforts his administration had initiated as well as his hopes for the future. Opening with a determined tone, Truman urged Americans to work together to repair racial schisms. He suggested that the country had reached a turning point that for the first time in its history, America was ready and willing to guarantee freedom and equality to all its citizens. He continued with an assertion that the government should protect and provide for all its peoples. According to the president, all Americans should possess decent homes, adequate, Medicare, adequate medical care, worthwhile employment, and right to a fair trial. Truman did not paint a one-sided naive picture, though. At the heart of his speech was a sobering, depiction of the social situation facing the nation during its post-World War II era, which included a discussion of disheartening issues ranging from racially motivated insults and intimidation to mob violence. 
However, he did not dwell on these grim topics, but instead cited the issues as fuel for promoting change. After observing the complexities in expanding and improving federal laws, Truman pointed out several examples of his administration's efforts to make such improvements, including the 1946 appointment of the President's Committee on Civil Rights and the request that Congress pass legislation to extend basic civil rights to people living in both Guam and American Samoa. Additionally, the President cited the United Nations Commission on Human Rights chaired by former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and the committee's efforts to prepare the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 5. Truman concluded his speech by invoking words Abraham Lincoln had written in 1862. The 16th president had called for, had called for the nation to remain united despite class or conditional barriers, not only for itself, but for future generations. Okay, so let me give you your question here. And so I'm not going to write the question up here on the screen. I'm just giving it to you right now. So your next question is to take this paragraph number four right here. And I'd like you to restate paragraph four in your own words. And I know this is tedious. I know this is hard. I know this is kind of boring and you'd probably rather do something else. But I, I promise you this is really important. All right, this is this is something that, you know, I'm putting in the video for, for a purpose here. All right, there is a method behind what we're doing right now. And I'd like you to take paragraph four and summarize this in your own words. All right, if you need to do it in, you know, two or three sentences, use two or three. If you could do it in one, do it in one. If you need, you know, four or five sentences, I don't really care. Just try to take this and restate number four in your own words, all right? So I'd like you to pause the video. This is really important and try it out and then uh, we'll go over my answer or at least a possible answer. Okay, so here's my example of how you could take this paragraph four and restate it. So I said, Truman discussed challenges and improving federal laws and gave an example of his administration's efforts. Truman's two examples are his 1946 appointment and the request for Congress to extend basic civil rights to people in Guam and American Samoa. Lastly, President Truman discussed the UN Commission on Human Rights and efforts to make a universal declaration of human rights. Okay, so obviously you're probably, it's a one in a billion chance you're going to have the same exact statement that I have, but hopefully I had a chance to practice this because we're now going to look at a question uh, that hopefully you'll be able to have an easier time getting right because of this exercise. Okay, so here's your question. President Truman mentioned the United Nations Commission on Human Rights during his speech to the NAACP in order to show A, how civil rights legislation worked outside of the U.S., B, his general support of civil rights in the United States and abroad, C, how the United States had learned valuable civil rights lessons from other countries, D, his belief that the United States had civil rights policies that should be adopted by other countries. So now would be a good time to pause the video, try to figure this out. Let me say that this paragraph four here, this is all you need to answer this question. So there's no need to go back and, and reread this or even read number five here. You just have to understand paragraph four here and that will be your key to getting this question right. So let's have you pause the video, try to answer this, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let me explain kind of a strategy that you can use here, all right, on your test. So one thing you can do is when you look at the questions, all right, look for kind of key words and phrases. Like in this question here, we see the key phrase, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So what you could do is come into the paragraph or come into the passage and find that phrase. So right here, we see this United Nations Commission on Human Rights. We say, hey, this shows up in paragraph four. So on your test, you could then just pause for a few moments and in your head, just, just reread paragraph four and in your head, just, just take a couple moments to just summarize or, or restate or paraphrase in your head the main ideas of, of four, all right? Just like I had you do. That's why I just had you do that exercise where you had to restate paragraph four, okay, in your own words. All right, so, so what I'm saying is on your test, you can do that, all right? You can pause, and you don't want to take forever to do this, and you don't want to do this for every single little question because you're probably going to run out of time. But for certain questions here, it's as simple as, you know, you find that key phrase in the question right here, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. You go into the passage, you find that phrase, reread this the text surrounding that. So in this case, that'd be paragraph four. Pause for a couple moments and just restate paragraph four in your own words. And then come and look at the answer choices and hopefully B would just jump right out at you if you do that, all right? 
So if you did the exercise where you read this and you restated it in your own words, like for example, answer choice C should be something you could eliminate right away if you did that, because this paragraph doesn't have anything to do with, with lessons learned from other countries here, right? It says how the U.S. had learned valuable civil rights lessons from other countries. Well, if you read this closely and, and practiced restating it in your own words, all right, C would hopefully be obviously wrong to you, okay? So B is the right answer here. And I'm just, just want to use this as an example just to show you how you can apply paraphrasing on your test. All right. So obviously it's going to be up to you when and where to apply this on your test. But this is just an example of how you can practically apply paraphrasing to get answers right on your test. By the way, this is my cat Tommy, who I mentioned earlier in the video. And if you watch multiple videos on my channel here, you're probably going to see him. So now let's talk about the SQR3 method, which is another really important reading comprehension strategy. This uh, was developed by Dr. Francis Robinson, who has PhD, and he originally developed this method to try to help people in the military improve their reading comprehension. And I just put this slide on here. I don't expect you to read this, but I just put this on here just to kind of show you that there's a lot of research and evidence behind this strategy here. And, you know, I just want to show you again that there is a method behind this. All right. And so I'm going to break down the traditional SQR3 method, and then I'm going to show you some changes that I would make uh, to make it more applicable to the GED. But the S stands for survey, which would be to survey the text before you read it to understand the topic in the main idea. And that would include looking at the title and the headings, look at any pictures or graphics, and also just kind of skim the introductory paragraph and the conclusion and pay attention to information in the first and last sentences. So especially if you're skimming a text, all right, uh, maybe if you are trying to answer those questions, sometimes, you know, you can look at the first sentence or the last sentence of a paragraph, and, and that can give you information about what's in the whole paragraph. So, you know, you might be able to, it can help you decide which paragraphs are worth reading and which paragraphs aren't if you're pressed for time in certain cases, maybe. But the Q stands for questions and write down any questions you have about the material from your survey. All right. So this is something that, you know, if you didn't have a timer ticking down, this might make more sense to write them down. All right. On the GED test, which I'll talk about this in a minute, but you're probably not going to have time to write down questions you have from surveying the material. Um, but the idea in the SQR3 method, though, is that by thinking of questions you have from surveying the text, helps you focus on the main ideas as you read. And it also just generally helps you focus. And the R's are, have, there's three R's here. So there's read, which is simply to read that passage or story and look for answers to the questions you came up with as you read. Recite would be to look away from the text and try to put it in your own words. And we already basically did this when we talked about the rap paraphrasing strategy, all right? We already kind of talked about this, but this is so important that it's also part of the SQR3 method. And reciting will help boost your memory and help you check what you're not understanding. So for example, if you try to explain something out loud and you kind of stumble and you have no idea how to explain it, you probably need to reread that part because you probably didn't uh, you know, fully get the understanding. And it's also, reciting is also gonna help you answer those questions you came up with in the Q phase. All right, and then lastly is to review what you've learned. And again, on the GED test, this is not really practical because you know, you're know you more concerned with getting those questions right. All right, you're not really here to learn just for the sake of having more knowledge, all right? And if you're reading as you practice for the GED test or just reading in your personal life, you know, the SQR3 method is, is something great to use and reviewing what you've learned is always a good idea just generally in real life, but for the purposes of the GED test, all right, this is probably just going to take up time. So uh, you also want to ask, did you answer all of your questions? And again, you know, this is something that would make more sense for a for practical purposes. Like if you're reading on your own or reading for school or something where you don't necessarily have a time pressure and multiple choice questions to answer. All right. But the SQR3 method is a very effective method, the way that I've just laid it out for you. But like I said, there's some, the, the method was obviously not intended for answering GED questions, okay? So I'm going to show you some adaptations I would make that would, will help you better apply this on the GED test. Now, like I said, in your personal reading, you know, you can use the SQR3 method as I've just taught it. But on the GED test, there's some, some little changes that we can make here. So 
The S will still stand for read the title, ask yourself if you know anything about the topic. Now, don't sit here and ponder this for 20 minutes if you know anything about the topic. Just read that title and just think, do I know anything about this topic, all right? Maybe you, you know, for example, if you're a really big baseball fan and the passage is about baseball, you're probably going to have an advantage, all right? Now, I don't know if they have any passages on the test about baseball, but that's just an example I thought of. Um, but anyway... Look at the other headings, look at any headings or subheadings before you start reading, and definitely skim some of those, look at some of the questions that you're supposed to be answering, all right, before you do the reading. I always recommend this. There, there is research behind this, too. It wasn't done just on the GED. It might have been, um, I can't remember now which test it was. Maybe it was SAT. I'm not sure, but there, there are studies done that show that if you look at the questions before you do the reading on multiple choice tests, it can boost your score, all right? So it's a, I would recommend you do this, all right? And also, you can just kind of skim that text. You know, focus on the intro and conclusion and just understanding the big picture of what you're going to read before you jump in. Um, and also, look at images or graphics for information. So I know, speaking of information, you might be thinking, well, this is a lot of information to take in. So let me make this really, really simple. Let me cut to the chase here, all right? If nothing else, the biggest takeaway from the SQR3 method for the GED test uh, is to not jump in to answering those questions and doing the reading right away, all right? So before you just jump in and start, you know, trying to tackle those questions and, and jump in and just, you know, uh, just, you know, get in there and, and grapple with the, the, the reading, all right? Just make sure that you stop first and read the title look at any pictures, and then look at the captions beneath the pictures, all right? Because a lot of times people don't do this, especially when they have the, the test taken down. They just jump right in and start reading the passage and start trying to answer the questions. And I'm not saying like that's necessarily like a bad thing. I just think that it's better if you just stop and just, you know, read that title, ask yourself if you know anything about that topic, and, you know, skim the, the questions. Look at the questions for that passage. You know, look at any pictures and captions. Because for some reason, some people, like, they just skip looking at pictures. They skip the captions. And sometimes they will stick a question in there that you have to look at the picture or that you have to read the caption to get the answer for. So don't skip that. And also, just reading the title. Sometimes, like, there'll be a question where reading the title of the piece can, can help you get that question right. I know it sounds far-fetched, but believe me, you know, a lot of people skip the title and they'll start reading the passage and then they start stressing out about the time ticking down and they have no idea what they're even reading. So stop first, just take a couple seconds, look at that title, look at those pictures, read the captions, look at the questions, and then jump in. You know, you don't want to spend forever doing this because you're just going to waste your time. All right, you don't want to spend like five minutes doing this pre-reading stuff. But, you know, just, just you know, an extra 20, 30 seconds pre-reading can, can help you get more questions right. All right, so just practice this too as you do your practicing. Um, but the questions, you know, you can just think about any questions you have about the material. You're probably not going to have time to write out a big list of questions, but you can look at the headings, look at the pictures, look at the title, and, you know, if there's any questions you have about the material, just answer them in your head. Just think about those questions, like, in your head. Think about what you're wondering, all right? Because you're probably not going to have time to write that out, all right? So, obviously, read. And, you know, think about where in the passage you'll find the answers to your questions. So, hopefully, you were able to at least, you know, skim the questions before you started your reading. And as you're reading, you know, if you remember any of the, the questions and you, you find the answer that you're reading... Go ahead and answer that question, you know, as you find the answer. But if not, you know, as you're reading, just think about possible places where there are answers to those questions, all right? And every now and then, just pause and ask yourself if you understand what you're reading. And the best way to do this is to just pause and, you know, try to just put it in your own words in your head, all right? Now, I said pause every now and then and ask yourself if you understand what you're reading. It's up to you to decide how often you want to do this. But I really think just this little step right here, this could be worth its weight in gold for you. This could be worth the, you know, the time that you've put into watching this video, which I know is a lot and I really appreciate it because I know you're busy and your time's probably limited. But, you know, this could be worth it. You know, just this every now and then as you're reading, just pause and make sure that you actually understand what you're reading. Now, you don't have to get tripped up on every single understanding, every single little detail, but, you know, you should as you're reading, pause and make sure you understand, you know, what you're reading and just turn away, you know, or 
okay, on your test, I guess, if you're doing it online and they're taping you, you don't really want to turn away. But, you know, just kind of just in your head, just see if you can summarize, you know, some of the main points of what you're reading every now and then. It's up to you to decide how often you want to do this, because if you spend too long on this or do this for every question, it just might be a big waste of time. But especially if you, you know, there's parts that you're not understanding, you might want to slow down and reread those parts. All right. And again, it's up to you to figure out, you know, kind of what balance is going to work for you. But, um, you know, th this is really an important an important strategy, all right? And also look for keywords or phrases in those questions and, you know, then skim through the passage and try to find them. And I already showed you an example of that, right, with that uh, President Truman passage that we looked at. But anyway, so that's the SQR3 method. The main takeaways I want you to see here are, number one, before you just jump into the reading, you know, do a little pre-reading. Look at that title, look at the pictures, look at the captions, you know, look at the questions for that passage. All right. It, you know, don't spend more than hopefully 30 seconds doing that. All right. Um, and then basically every now and then as you're reading, just kind of pause and just ask yourself, do I understand what I'm reading? And a good way to do that is to just see if you can pause and in your head, you know, just, re, you know, restate the main points, put it in your own words, so to speak. All right. And it's up to you to determine how often you want to do that, or if you want to do that at all, because sometimes maybe you'll find that that's just going to take up too much more time. But, you know, the way I look at it is if that can help you understand what you're reading, then you're going to be able to get more questions right and get a higher score. All right. And so that's SQR3 for the GED. Day had dawn cold and gray when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail. He climbed the high earth bank where a little traveled trail led east through the pine forest. It was a high bank, and he paused to breathe at the top. He excused the act to himself by looking at his watch. It was nine o'clock in the morning. There was no sun or promise of sun, although there was not a cloud in the sky. So your first question, which of the following is true? A. The man is hiking on the main Yukon Trail. B. The story takes place in the evening. C. The trail the man traveled on leads west or D. None of the above. So let's have you pause the video. I'm going to turn it over to you to try this out. And then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the answer here is D, none of the above. So it tells us here in the first line that he turned aside from the main trail so we could take A out. We also know that in the morning, it's it says it's 9 o'clock in the morning on his watch. So we know that this is not in the evening. And also it says that the trail that he was walking on, okay, it does not say that it travel to the west. In fact, it says the trail led east through the pine forest. So, so that's how we would get D. Okay, it was a clear day. However, there seemed to be an indescribable darkness over the face of things. That was because the sun was absent from the blank. This fact did not worry the man. He was not alarmed by the lack of sun. It had been days since he had seen the sun. So we have a challenge question for you here, and I, I'd like you to try to figure out which word, or I guess try to guess which word would fit in the blank here? And, and this is very hard to do without multiple choice answers here. So don't feel bad at all if you get this wrong. All right, there's, I just want you to practice trying this because it's gonna help you with reading comprehension to practice doing some of these where you have to come up with your own words. So I don't care if you get this right or wrong. In fact, it's hard to guess this correctly without any uh, multiple choice answers, but just try it and see how you do. So now's your chance to pause the video and try this. Okay, so sky is the right answer here, and if you got that, really good job. But either way, like I said, it, it's this is hard to do, so I'm not expecting that everyone will get this right. So don't don't feel bad. All right, this is it's all about the process of trying to come up with the word that you think fits in the blank and how that's going to boost your reading comprehension. The man looked along the way he had come. The Yukon lay a mile wide and hidden under three feet of ice. On top of this ice were as many feet of snow. It was all pure white, north and south as far as his eye could see. It was unbroken white. The only thing that relieved the whiteness was a thin dark line that curved from the pine-covered island to the south. It curved into the north where it disappeared behind another pine-covered island. So your question this time is which of the following is false? A. The thin dark line curved into the west. B. North and south he could only see white. C. The Yukon was hidden under three feet of snow, or D. None of the above. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. 
Okay, so the correct answer here is A, right? It tells us that first it says it curved, uh, it says it curved from the pine covered island to the south, then it says it curved into the north. So west does not come up here, so A is false. The dark line was the trail, the main trail. It led south 500 miles to Chilkoot Pass in salt water. It led north 75 miles to Dawson and still farther on to the north, 1,000 miles to Nulato. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, and finally to St. Michael on Bering, Bering Sea, 1,000 miles and a, and a half a thousand more. And my computer just underlined that word Chilkoot, so don't worry about that. That has nothing to do with the question. And here's the actual question. Which of the following is true? A. Heading north on the trail, the man would arrive at St. Michael before Naluto. B. Traveling south 75 miles, the man would arrive at Dawson. C. The shortest distance to salt water is to travel to the Bering Sea. Or D. Head south 500 miles, the man would arrive at uh, Chilkoot Path. And I think that should say heading south. But anyway, so you can pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so it says here that uh, heading north on the trail, it says it would lead 75 miles. So north 75 miles gets you to Dawson, then farther north, about 1,000 miles, would get you to Naledo. And then finally, St. Michael. So you would not arrive at St. Michael first. You would arrive at Naledo first, according to the passage. So A is out. Now B, traveling south 75 miles would get the man to Dawson. It's actually north, so he'd have to go north. So going south 75 miles is the wrong direction to go to Dawson. Then C, the shortest distance to salt water is to travel to the Bering Sea. What actually tells us that south is 500 miles to Chilkoot Pass and salt water. Uh, the Bering Sea would be thousands and thousands of miles that he would have to get to. So it's, the Bering Sea is much further according to the directions here. And D is the correct answer. Okay. It goes on to say, but all this, the distant trail, no sun in the sky, the great cold, and the strangeness of it all, had no effect on the man. It was not because he was long familiar with it. He was a newcomer in the land, and this was his first winter. So your next question. What is the most likely explanation for why the harsh conditions have no effect on the man? A. He is experienced at traveling in harsh conditions. B. He has friends waiting farther up the trail to help him. C. He is overconfident in his ability to travel in harsh conditions. Or D. The man is close to a big city. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so in this case here, it's that he's probably overconfident in his ability to travel in harsh conditions, right? Now, B is possible, right? It's possible that he has friends waiting further up the trail to help him, but that's not the most likely explanation here. Okay, that he might have people waiting up the trail to help him, but you know we would not logically come up with that explanation here because it doesn't mention anything about this. Now, it could be possible, but it's not mentioned. And what about D? The man is close to a big city. Well, we know that from the last uh, the last part of the story here, it tells us that you know if you follow the trail south 500 miles, you get to Chilkoot Pass. If you follow it 75 miles north, you get to Dawson. So. As far as we know, he, he is. we don't even know if these locations like Dawson, like it doesn't really sound like that's a big city. It probably sounds like a village, like kind of out in the middle of the mountains or wherever he is. Um, but basically, you know, he's probably not close to a big city. All right. And even if Dawson or those other locations like Jill, Jill what is it called? Uh, Chilkoot Pass. All right. That's probably not a big city. But even if it is, those are pretty far away from where he's at right now. We'd have to walk hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of miles to get to these locations. So he's not close to a big city, if those are big cities, which they probably aren't. Um, and so what about A? He is experienced at traveling in harsh conditions. Well, it says here that he's not familiar with this. He's a newcomer to the land. It's his first winter. So he's probably, so actually he's, if anything, inexperienced in traveling in these kinds of conditions. Okay. The trouble with him was that he was not able to imagine. He was quick and ready in the things of life, but only in the things and not in their means. 50 degrees below zero meant 80 degrees of frost. Such facts told him that it was cold and uncomfortable, and that was all. It did not lead him to consider his weaknesses as a creature affected by temperature. Nor did he think about man's general weakness, able to live only within narrow limits of heat and cold. So the question for you now is a critical thinking exercise to help you process more deeply as you read. 
What do you predict is going to happen? There's no right or wrong answer here per se, but what do you predict will happen based off of what you know? So let's have you pause the video and try that. Okay, so basically, you know, I'm just going to answer right here. I didn't type this out on the slide, but probably what it sounds like is that he's going to reach some kind of trouble because he's clearly, he's wandering around off of the main trail in really harsh, really cold conditions where he has the potential to, you know, freeze or just, there's a lot of issues that could happen here, right? He's wandering around unprepared, inexperienced in, you know, a, a very cold area that's potentially dangerous. So he's probably going to come up against some kind of trouble uh, due to the harsh conditions. So that would be my prediction. Now we're going to switch gears here and we're going to read uh, another excerpt here. And uh, this one's a little bit scary. Uh, at least some people might find this a little scary. So just a little trigger warning. Um, but it says, unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Wretched is he who looks back upon alone hours in vast and dismal chambers with brown hangings and maddening rows of antique books, or upon odd watches and twilight groves of grotesque, gigantic, and vine-encumbered trees that silently wave twisted branches far aloft. And yet I am strangely content and cling desperately to those sere moments when my mind momentarily threatens to reach beyond to the other. Question. The word grotesque most likely means which of the following? Is it A. Strange or unnatural in appearance? B. Oversized? C. Nostalgic? Or is it D. Expensive? So now would be a good time to have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, the correct answer here is strange or unnatural in appearance. So great job if you got that, and if not, great job for sticking with us so far into the video. I know not where I was born, save that the castle was infinitely old and infinitely horrible, full of dark passages and having high ceilings where the eye could find only cobwebs and shadows. The stones in the crumbling corridors seemed always hideously damp, and there was an accursed smell everywhere. It was never light so that I used sometimes to light candles and gaze steadily at them for relief. Nor was there any sun outdoors since the terrible trees grew high above the topmost accessible tower. So your question, what is the setting of the story? So pause the video, try to figure this out. Hopefully you're starting to get into a routine of looking for the settings as you're reading. Uh, so let's have you try this out. Okay, so what we know is that this is some kind of a castle, all right? And he can't remember where he was born. He just knows that he's been in this castle for as long as he can remember. So castle is the right answer here. There was one black tower which reached above the trees into the unknown outer sky, but that was partly ruined and could not be ascended save by a well-nigh impossible climb up the sheer wall, stone by stone. I must have lived years in this place, but I cannot measure the time. Beings must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself or anything alive but the noiseless rats and bats and spiders. Question, which of the following is false? A, the main character cannot remember any other person. B, the tower is easily climbed. C, the main character cannot measure the time. Or D, none of the above. So you know the drill by now. Thank you again for sticking with me. You can pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so in this case, it's B, because it says that the tower is well nigh impossible to climb up that wall, all right? Well nigh impossible means it's basically impossible. Like there might be a chance it could be done, but it's practically impossible. All right, so the tower is not easily climbed, so B is false. No teacher urged or guided me, and I do not recall hearing any human voices in all those years, not even my own. For although I had read of speech, I had never thought to try to speak aloud. My aspect was a matter equally unthought of, for there were no mirrors in the castle, and I merely regarded myself by instinct as akin to the youthful figures I saw drawn and painted in the blank. I felt conscious, conscious of youth because I remembered so little. So here's a challenge for you. Which word do you think fits in the blank above? And I'd like you to take your time with this and, and just think, maybe consider a couple possibilities. And I don't expect that, you know, I don't necessarily expect that you'll get this right, although you might. And, and the reason I say I don't expect that, you know, people will, will get this right is because it's very hard to come up with a word in the blank without any kind of clues. All right. It's hard to get that exact word right, but maybe you will. All right. So let's have you try try this. Just try your best and, and just think about the context here. 
think about some words that could possibly fit in that blank here, and then I'll show you what word really fit there. So the answer here is books, and you did a really, really great job if you came up with that. And if you came up with something close to this, then you did a really great job. Like I said, you know, you, it's really hard to get these pinpoint accurate without seeing a list of possibilities. All right, so I, either way, just for trying this, you know, that's a tough one to do. So uh, don't feel bad if you didn't get that by any means. Outside across the putrid moat and under the dark mute trees, I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books and would longingly picture myself amidst crowds in the sunny world beyond the endless forest. Once I tried to escape from the forest, but as I went farther from the castle, the shade grew denser and the air more filled with brooding fear, so that I frantically, I ran frantically back lest I lose my way in a labyrinth of nighted silence. Question, how could you restate this paragraph in your own words? So let's have you pause the video and try to do this now, and then when you're ready, I'll show you a possible answer. Okay, so, you know, this is one of those questions where, you know, you're not going to have probably, there is not really a right or wrong answer here, and there's different directions you could go with kind of restating this, but a possible answer could be the main character wished to experience the world beyond the forest, but was too scared to escape when he tried to. And, you know, like I said, there's different directions you could go with this. All right, this is just one possible answer. So through endless twilights, I dreamed and waited, though I knew not what I waited for. Then in the shadowy solitude, my longing for light grew so frantic that I could rest no more. And I lifted entreating hands to the single black ruined tower that reached above the forest into the unknown outer sky. And at last I resolved to scale that tower, fall though I might, since it were better to glimpse the sky at perish than to live without ever beholding day. Question, which best describes the conflict at this point in the story? A, the main character wants to experience the sky, but climbing the tower is dangerous. B, the main character suspects someone else is in the castle. C, the main character knows not what he's waiting for. Or D, the main character is out of matches. So in, in D, for some reason, like this looks like it's bolded here, but there's no reason for that. It's just something my computer did, or maybe I did it without realizing it. But just ignore that this D looks kind of bigger than the other uh, answer choices. And let's have you pause the video and try your best with this. And then when you're ready, we'll go over the right answer here. Okay, so a couple things to note here. So one, the main character knows not what he's waiting for. It does say exactly in the text, though I knew not what I waited for. Okay, but does that really describe the exact conflict at this point in the story? I don't think that really describes the main conflict that's happening here. That's just something that is true. It's a true statement, more or less, but we don't know. I don't think that that best describes the conflict. So that's why C would not be the right answer here. And the main, the right answer here is A. And let me give you another tip here, since you made it this far into the video. All right, I know that a lot of people probably won't make it this far into the video, and you know I, I can understand that time is limited, but since you made it this far into the video and since you're watching this right now, let me throw a little tip in here for you. And that tip is that sometimes if you don't know which answer choice to guess, all right, the longest answer choice is often the one that you want to guess, okay? Now, this is not always going to be true. It's not going to work 100% of the time, and ideally you will be able to use your reading comprehension skills to get the questions right, and you won't have to work on guessing, and you won't have to rely on guessing, okay? But if you do, you usually want to guess the, the longest and most detailed answer. And let me tell you why that is. So when the test writers have to write the right questions like this, okay, you know, the correct answer, they usually have to take the time to write out a detailed answer, and then they have to make up a couple other answers, right, to uh, fill out the answer choices here. So you'll have one answer choice that's like long and detailed and very specific, and then, you know, two or three bogus answer choices that they didn't really put much thought into writing. And that's oftentimes why the longest and most detailed one is correct. That is not always going to be true, like I said, so I just want to throw that out there. But just something to note here.